weeks has shared about thinking differently. And not thinking like the world. It's called renewing our minds. He also shared about acting in our faith. Living out the Christian faith. WWJD. And I would like to continue in that vein. Don't be like the Pharisees. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you are our God and we are your people. And Father, you are dwelling amongst us. So I just want to thank you, Father, that you're here tonight. And Lord, you're going to help me to deliver this message. And Father, I'm going to help those that may need to hear it to have their ears open. And Father, we all need change in our lives. And so I thank you that you will just uh, use this to whatever purpose for the kingdom. So I thank you, Father, for this. Amen. About six months ago, I said, I have a message. And here it is tonight. I'm going to be delivering it. I said to Rob, I've got a message. But it's going to take me a while to get it all together. So I'm just not like my husband. He's pretty good. It takes me a while. So I just want to thank you, Rob and Elaine, for allowing me to share the word tonight. It's a privilege to be here. So thank you very much. Tonight, the question that I hope to answer for you is, what does it look like to follow Jesus? If we all had a video of our lives and it was played to someone else, would they know that you were a follower of Jesus? And if our Bibles and our meeting places were all taken away from us, would the world see Jesus in us? And would people who believe know that I believe in the same God? These are questions that I've asked myself over many, many years. So what makes us so different to the world? Look, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> well, I believe the difference is our core values of the Bible. And they are love God and love others. Matthew 22, verses 35 to 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hangs the whole law and the prophets. Now, I feel that there's been a bit of confusion in the church of what the God kind of love is. You see, if I love my neighbour as myself, I can see myself as the most important person in the world. And I must have the best of everything. You see, I'm a pretty good person, after all. And I always give you the best of everything that I want. The thing is, is that we don't give the best to others because I'm the most important person in the world. The other side of the coin is that what if I don't even like who I am? Does that mean that I will treat others the way I feel? What is this God kind of love that we are to work within us so that we can work it out? God says it's a new and living way that we are to walk. Now, you know, Nicodemus had to wrestle this out in John 3 verses 1 to 15. He saw something different in Jesus' life and he wanted to know what it was. Jesus said to him, you need to be born again. Nicodemus is like, man, how can I enter my mother's womb and be born into a 
different family. You see, to be a Pharisee of those days, you had to be born into the right family. And then you had to learn the way of a rabbi. Nicodemus could see it in the natural, but he couldn't see it in the spiritual. Jesus went on to explain it to him that the ways of God are to be received by faith. Just like a baby born, he or she enters into the world of their family. It's the same with us in the spiritual. We are to be born in God's spiritual family by believing and having faith in Jesus Christ our Messiah. And then, just like a baby, we need to learn how to live in the family. If you've accepted Jesus' invitation into his family, then now it's about living here on earth to display his kingdom. In, his, in displaying the kingdom on earth, we are to hear and obey his word. You know, we get to practice the way of the kingdom on earth before we get to heaven. How cool is that? We get practicals here. Woo! Heaven isn't about when I die. It actually starts now, the moment we're born again on earth. And here is a kingdom way of life. And he invites us to practice this. It's found in Matthew 5, verses 38 to 39. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist him who is evil. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. A few months ago, Paul said to me, Robin, hitch up the bike. I'm like, hmm. Now, what's he talking about? Is he talking about he wants the bike hitched to something? Does he want something hitched to the bike? And what was that something? I thought, oh, goodness, honey, what are, you, what are you talking about? What do you want? What's this hitching the bike? He says to me, now, I want you to hitch the trailer to the bike. I said, I know. Oh, I can do that. I know what you're talking about now. Sometimes I find that the Bible's a bit like that. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What does that mean? Surely God doesn't allow me to pluck out someone's eye if they've hurt mine or if someone's damaged my tooth that I could go around and, you know, damage their tooth. No, but well, you know what? That could be appealing sometimes. <laughs> But I really get the feeling that that's not what God's talking about. Nor is it the way of the kingdom. I think I need some more information. Jesus first addresses in that, um, in that verse. He says, you have heard it was said. I'm like, you have heard it said. So why, why didn't he say it is written? Because a few chapters before he says, to say, it is written. Why is he now gone, well, you've heard it said. So something must be different about this statement. And different it is, because I found out that it was said by the Pharisees and the scribes of that time. They were in charge of the law, all the instructions of God, and they came up with some really good ideas. Well, anyway, they thought so. At this time, the Pharisees felt that they had the power to be like Moses. And that was that they could write God's laws. <coughs> There's only one thing wrong with that, is that Moses didn't write God's laws. Let me show you. In Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18. It says, And when he, God, had finished speaking with him, Moses, upon Mount Sinai, he gave the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written by the finger of God. Then in Exodus 32, 15 and 16, 
Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets which were written on both sides. In case you don't know what that means, he then goes on to say, they were written on one side and on the other. And the tablets were, writ were God's work and the writing was God's <coughs> writing engraved on the tablets. One could almost literally say that this is the word of God because man didn't write them. Then God made it plain that no one was to change them. In Deuteronomy 4 verse 2 and Deuteronomy 3, uh, sorry, Deuteronomy 12 verse 32, they both say the same, you shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And in Matthew 5 verse 17, Jesus actually agrees with this. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. That word fulfill is explained in Romans chapter 13 verse 10. Love does no wrong to a neighbour. Love, therefore, is the fulfilment of the law. So Jesus didn't come to abolish the law or the instructions of God, but he came to put love into it. Love was the missing ingredient why people found God's instructions so hard to do. How many people know, here, know, that if someone you don't love asks you to do something, it's going to be one of the most hardest tasks for you to do. So the Pharisees changed God's law and gave the people their made-up rules and regulations so that they could feel important. But for it to sound like God, they had to put some of his flavour in it. Just like when Jesus was in the wilderness, Satan comes to him and says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels charge concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. So what Satan was saying was basically true, but he left out one line, very important line, to guard you in all your ways. Angels are there to guard you from danger, not put you in the way of danger. You know, really, jump off a cliff and expect God to have his angels bear you up? Well, to me that's stupidity unless you've got a parachute. All of God's laws work harmoniously together. Gravity says if you jump you're going to fall to the ground flat. But God is able to protect us with his angels if we're doing his will. His angels are guarding me from danger the cliff. And so the Pharisees had, to, had changed the meaning of God's word just like Satan did. How many of you think that that's a very good idea? No wonder Jesus wasn't happy with the Pharisees or the scribes. So this quote, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, is in the instructions for life. But what the Pharisees did is that they changed the meaning of it. And some of you might like the meaning of it. You want to hear it? Okay. If someone punched you, you could punch them right back. And if someone insulted you, he or she was fair game for your insults. Now, as I said before, that could be appealing to so many people, but it is not God's ways. These Pharisees or religious leaders of Jesus' day ignored the courts of justice as God had given it. They taught that seeking personal revenge was acceptable. What God wrote about an eye for an eye 
was a requirement of the Mosaic law, not as a harsh statement that required cruel punishment or an unbalanced punishment. Instead, it was a mandate for equality before the law. Each criminal had to pay for his own crime. And all of this is found in Exodus 21, verses 24, Leviticus 24, 17 to 23, and Deuteronomy 19 to 21. So this statement is a case being judged before a civil authority such as a judge. It was intended, intended to be a guiding principle for lawyers and judges, but never for people to take as a re revenge action. So a large injustice had happened and it needed to be sorted out in a fair and balanced way in a law of court. So Jesus addressed this issue and he was bringing the people back to his original instructions. And in verse 39 it says, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Well, in the Bible there are plenty of scriptures where it talks about resisting evil. So something must be quite right here. And it is in the translation from Hebrew to Greek that has changed the meaning of this scripture. Quite frankly, it really doesn't make much sense. But the, if you look at it this way, do not compete. So in other words, do not compete with evildoers or do not bring yourself to burn to anger. Do not be the same as them. Do not burn with anger against them. Sort this matter out. This matter doesn't need the courts, but it does need to be sorted out. This is an everyday misunderstanding that triggered anger in someone. But when this happened, God warns us not to be like the Pharisees who taught the people to take their own revenge. Their motto was, do unto others as they do to you. The trouble with that is our measuring sticks are unbalanced. All we need to do is just look at the TV and the news and see the Pharisees there of road rage. Someone cut in front of them and by jingo, you are one car in front of me and wait till we get to the next light. I'm getting out of the car and I have my baseball bat and I'm just going to smash your window. Very unbalanced. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. This is not a literal slapping, people. This statement is a figure of speech. It's a picture of what was happening and the people of this day understood this picture. Now I'm going to need a volunteer somewhere and I will pick the volunteer and there he is right there. Honey, come up here. This is what I got earlier. <laughs> We've been practicing, I'm sorry. But, um, face me, please, darling. So, it says here that we're going to have a slightly good time. <laughs> so, they say that whoever slaps you on your right cheek, here's his right cheek. It's gorgeous, but here it is. And so, here I go, I'm going to give him a good slap. Slap him. So when I slapped him on his right cheek, I had to use my left hand. Okay? Now the Bible says the left cheek slap him. If it was I was using my right hand, it would have been a backhand slap like that. Okay, so that's the picture that they had. Sorry, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no one was hurt here. I'll just put a disclaimer. We're all well, okay. Everyone's fine. Thank you. Beautiful assistant. Thank you. So, the right hand, this is what they 
knew back then when Jesus was bringing this. The right hand is shaking someone's hand. It's for eating. And the left hand was for, I just have to come this way. And the left hand was for <laughs> toilet purposes. <laughs> That's all I can say. So when someone's slapping you with their left hand, what they're basically saying is that you're crap. So, you know, that slap could be ways of a look. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm just going to avoid you. Oh, I can't help anymore. I'm sorry. No. Could even be silent words. Oh. Could be angry words. Could be anything that you feel the slap. This is a minor insult. No one died. No one was run over. No one was robbed. No one was injured. It's a misunderstanding. And someone isn't happy with the way that you did something or what you said. Some feelings got hurt. Do we do the same back to them? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth like the Pharisees? Does this all really fix the problem? No, God's not into abuses of any kind and he certainly does allow people to do whatever they want to do to others. Jesus had the solution and he said, turn the other cheek. And when you turn the other cheek, this tells the person to address me as an equal. I am just the same as you. You are just the same as me. We all do things wrong. No one is perfect. When I realised that, man, that was so freeing for me. So freeing. You know, it didn't bind me up, it freed me. No one is better than me, and no one is worse than me. You know, Jesus didn't come to tell us what job that we were to do. He doesn't write in his Bible, well, you're going to do this kind of job, and you're going to do that kind of his ways are about how we treat people when we're doing things. You can do any job. You know? I'm a professional gate opener. <laughs> I have opened many a gate. And I'm good at it. I'm the best in my field. <laughs> and I am a qualified tour guide. And I love my jobs. But in the midst of them, stuff happens. It is in those times that my light can shine the brightest when I do things God's ways. Because he does a miracle. But we can think too highly of ourselves and we could say, you know, I would never do that. What you just did, well, there's a slap right there. Well, let me just tell you, the day isn't over. And you still have a chance to do it. <laughs> and you may never know. You may already have done it. But you just haven't recognised it. I've heard so many people lately where they would say, oh, this person did that thing and that, and that. And then they've done exactly, I saw that they just done exactly the same thing recognise it. I have done that many a times as 
well. The other thing we do as broken people is we make up excuses why we do things wrong and excuse ourselves, but we hold the other person accountable for what they did. We judge others by, our, by their actions and ourselves by our intentions. Intentions are just as bad as actions. But most of the time, we, we don't mean to offend and for others to feel bad. It's only because we're not thinking of others more than ourselves. And you know, maybe that other person wasn't either. We are funny people. We can never say, I would never do that, or I would never say that, because sometimes under extreme situations, we do things we wouldn't normally do. I had a friend just last year, oh, my heart was just going out for her, and she was telling me about a situation that she did and said, and she says, Robert, I never thought I would say or do that, but under extreme pressure, I did it, and I feel so ashamed. We can never say that we would never do it. So how do we deal with insults, misunderstandings, wrongs, dumb words? Do you think maybe a good way forward is talking about the situation calmly? Maybe we could ask the, some the person, you know, why are you angry? Or is everything all right with you? Did I do something wrong and why was it wrong? I've even asked myself this one. How can I change to help you? In doing this, we can learn something about the person that will bring a deeper relationship or I just might need to apologise. God knows that there will be a slap, but not slapping at all at all is far better. When we get the revelation of his ways, you start using statements like this when people haven't met our expectations. You know what, I've done that before. Oh, I could do that one day. I'm not perfect and I'm quite capable of doing the same. It's just a mistake, we're not offended, all good, we are all the same, we are all broken people. Isn't talking our way through problems the best way forward? We're not always right in our slap, so our actions and words aren't always right. Apologise for, for slapping or an apology for not thinking about them is a good way forward. Not every person wakes up in the morning and thinks, how can I make someone's day hell today? Do any of you wake up and think, man, who can I make, you know, day, how can I make someone's day hell today? No one. We don't. It just, things just happen. Generally, it is a misunderstanding. Seeing the other person's point of view is very handy in getting along. Sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we get it wrong. We can praise God either way. If we get it right, praise God, I must have learned something. And if we get it wrong, praise God because His Son is my atonement for my sin when I repent. Being equal means that I need Jesus in my life daily. I need his forgiveness. I need his grace. I need his mercy. And I need the Holy Spirit in my life daily to help me work out his instructions. And if we can't see eye to eye, then forgiveness is always the best way forward. <coughs> We don't have to be right to be right. 
You know, we really don't have to be right to be right. So what does it look like to follow Jesus? First, there's an acceptance of his invitation into his kingdom by faith in Jesus our Messiah. And then we're to learn about his kingdom, his ways. It simply means hear and obey. In his kingdom, we're all equals. Can we change the video of our life and have others say, I would like to be like you. I know I'm changing mine and I give you the opportunity to do the same. If our Bibles and meeting places were taken away, would the world see Jesus in us? And would people who believe know that I believe in the same God? What would Jesus do? Well, he did do the, the law perfectly and he gave me grace and mercy. He didn't do it perfectly so that I don't have to do it. He came to show me the way. Amen. Shouldn't we be people who want to do the same? Jesus said it himself. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. Jesus came to put his love into his way of doing things, and that changed everything. May we be people who do not follow the ways of the Pharisees and scribes, who made up God's instructions to suit themselves and to make themselves feel important. May we be people who don't follow the ways of man and do whatever they feel is right and get angry over the small things. May we be people who follow our Messiah with a heart of love. When we hear and obey God's instructions, it has a twofold. We love God, obey His commandments, that's His love language, we're doing His love language, love God, and then we love others. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. This is freeing stuff, not binding stuff. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for your instructions. Father, you guide us all our days. Father, this gives us peace with people and peace with you. And Father, I just want to thank you that you have put your love into these instructions. And Father, I want to follow you with a heart of love for what you hold dearly. So I thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for your grace and your mercy that you have given me, follows me all the days of my life. And I thank you, Father, for these people, that, Lord, that you will just bring whatever you need back to their remembrance when they need to know it. And I thank you, Father, for your goodness. Blessings to you all. Thank you for your beautiful listening ears.